All right, so we've just finished the genetics and protein synthesis lecture. Let's do some challenge questions. So challenge question number one, P53. This excerpt describes P53 and comes from the National Center for Biotechnology Information. So I'm going to read this to you. So the P53 gene is a tumor suppressor. Its activity stops the formation of tumors. If a person inherits only one functional copy of the P53 gene from their parents, they are predisposed to cancer and usually develop several independent tumors in a variety of tissues in early adulthood. Skip to the goods. The P53 gene has been mapped to chromosome 17. In the cell, P53 protein binds DNA which in turn stimulates another gene called P21. Ultimately, P21 stops the cell cycle, so if the cell has mutations, it cannot pass through to the next stage of cell division. However, mutant P53 can no longer bind the DNA and do its job. As a consequence, the P21 and other proteins are not made to stop the cell cycle. This leads to cells dividing uncontrollably and forming tumors. Okay, let's think of some key words that you see here. First of all, P53 binds to the DNA and stimulates another gene to be activated, producing a protein called P21. This can have, if mutated, very deleterious effects on the cell, leading to multiple tumors being formed. Let's take a look at a model for P53. And I want you to be thinking about what kind of gene regulation are we describing here? So normally P53 stops the cell cycle and allows DNA to occur, DNA repair to occur. It does that by activating a group of genes involved in cell cycle DNA repair, cell cycle restarting, and apoptosis or programmed cell death. When P53 is mutated or not functioning properly, it cannot regulate those genes and therefore the cell cycle can continue unchecked, leading to cancer and tumor formation. So, pause for a minute. What kind of gene regulation is this. If you said transcription regulation, you were correct. P53 is a transcription factor and a very important one. It controls hundreds or thousands of genes regulating cell cycle and DNA repair. If you're really interested in this, I'm linking a PDF here to you that summarizes the transcription regulation by P53. All right, next question. I've been talking to my family a lot this week about mRNA vaccines. So we just talked about the function of mRNA in a cell. So now you can be experts with their family when you're talking about these mRNA vaccines that are so important in the news right now. So mRNA vaccines work by introducing mRNA into the cell because we can sequence genes in any organism, including viruses. We can understand the genes and how they function within a particular pathogen or disease-causing organism. So we can sequence particular parts of a virus or a bacteria 
and use that to trick a cell into believing it's been infected. So an mRNA sequence, for example, from the SARS-CoV-2 virus can be replicated in the lab and used to form an mRNA vaccine. The current mRNA vaccines for SARS-CoV-2 are forming mRNA for the spike protein. Spike protein is a portion of the SARS-CoV-2 RNA genome, these are RNA viruses, that is just a piece. So alone, the spike protein cannot cause disease. It's just a piece of the RNA genome of the virus. So the spike protein then is the basis of these COVID-19 vaccines. So this spike protein is a conserved region and acts as an antigen. In other words, acts as something that can stimulate the immune system. Okay, think about it. What happens when you put mRNA into the body cells? How do you think these vaccines work? Pause for a second and think about what we know of mRNA. Now, I don't often show images straight from a pharmaceutical company's website, so my apologies here. I have absolutely no ties to these pharmaceutical companies. It's just that this information is relatively new, so this was the best diagram that I could find to show you how some of these mRNA vaccines are working. So let me zoom in here to show you this diagram. So there's an mRNA inside the vaccine. That mRNA goes into the cells. The muscle cell is where these uh, vaccines are being injected. So it goes into the muscle cell and it finds a ribosome. It uses that ribosome to produce the protein that it encodes. In the case of these vaccines, it's encoding the viral protein, spike proteins. Once those proteins are made in the cell, the mRNA is degraded and the protein sticks around. The body recognizes that this spike protein is not one of its regular proteins and it will then display that viral protein on the surface of the cell. We'll talk more about how this display activates the immune system when we get to the immune system lecture, but the important thing here is that the mRNA is being used to produce the protein. After the protein is produced, it sticks around in the cell to activate the immune system and the mRNA is degraded. There was never any portion of a virus that was injected into the cell. So other vaccines sometimes use attenuated or degraded viruses or pieces of proteins directly injected into the cell. In this case, it's mRNA, which is then translated in the cytoplasm. So understanding the process of translation, now you can explain how these mRNA vaccines produce viral proteins. So the answer to this one is that mRNA is translated into the spike protein in the muscle cells in which it was injected. And then the immune system now has the ability to find and use that spike protein for its immune memory. And that's the basis of the memory cells that can be formed by the immune system to recognize and fight the actual virus if it ever comes in contact with it. All right, that's it for today. I hope this was helpful. Please add any, any questions in the comments below 
and I'll see you soon.